Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Focus TV. Man, I'm losing track of what number of episodes these are. 113. Cardell keeps track, man. I don't know. Just every Tuesday Bobby runs together. The Fridays run together. But we got a lot to talk about. So much has happened since last week's show. Uh, we got Octavia Wyatt here, Cardell Dudley, and Wilson Tarkin Jr. And there's a lot to discuss as last week's show, Cardell was t- giving us a preview about the Portsmouth, this year's Ports mm-hmm. Invitational Tournament. So, uh, you know, like every event that you go to, we look forward to the list of the people that did actually stand out and why. I know you said you're going to break them down into three groups. Right. So we're going to start with the point guards, then we're going to get to the wings, then to the front court players. Right. After that, we got some DC United. We're gonna talk, definitely talk about these NBA playoffs because uh, you know we're getting closer to round two, and some of those matchups look very, very, very good. Um, and then you know the NFL draft, you know, uh, two days away. We're right here. Quick thoughts. We're gonna go over some things. We, you know, I tell you, we're gonna ask our Tavia about what she feels the NFC East teams should do. We're gonna talk about what we would like our prospective teams to do. Then you know we we gonna get out of here, man. You know, that easy, that simple. But Cardell, the floor is yours. Which point guard stood out to you this year at uh, Portsmouth Invitational? Before I get started with the point guards, um, just for people that may not know about the Portsmouth Invitational, it's uh, the longest running, I guess you could say, draft combine. Uh, It's the first one that kind of kicks off the draft, pre-draft season. And what it does is brings about 80 of the top seniors in college basketball to come compete in front of NBA scouts and FIBA scouts and executives, front office personnel. you know, this year was kind of different because of the G League, G League Elite camp that's about to go down like a, a few days before the, the actual NBA combine. So it was a lot of doubt about who would come if they would, if the PIT would draw, you know, notable players. But it ended up doing just that. And it was highly competitive. Honestly, this was my third year covering it in a row. It was probably the most competitive I've seen where – Guys were really getting after and diving on the floor, no hesitation, going after blocks. Dudes coming through the lane, trying to dunk on them. They blocking them, putting them on their back. It was it, it kind of brought you back to the nineties. That's how hard they was playing, trying to get jobs, and that's essentially what they're doing. They're trying to get a job offer, and you, the goal is to try to press there to get to the combine. You see what I'm saying? Or get to the G League camp, and then that way you can. Or it, it also helps you get more workouts so you can try to press more scouts and hopefully sneak into the draft or if not at the least you know at the worst case scenario get a two-way deal uh some notable alums from that you watching one right now in the playoffs for the spurs Derek white he came out 2017 uh blew up at the pit went to the combine played well spurs drafted on 29th and you see him doing work right now in the playoffs uh, other notable alums were scotty pippen dennis Rodman, uh, john stockton tim hardaway ben wallace uh, Avery Johnson, Admiral, Jeremy Lin, Rick Berry, Dave Cowens, Earl Marone, Jimmy Butler, another person you see doing work for the Sixers right now. Uh, the, the G League Elite Camp will take place May 13th and 14th, so the top performers from the PIT will get invited to that, and the top performers from the G League Elite Camp will get invited to the main combine in Chicago, which takes place uh, May 15th to the 19th, and that's when they have all the top prospects, the underclassmen, everybody play in front of basically in the entire league. Um, and you know that's just that's just where we at with it. So I'm gonna get started with the point guards, and it's a lot of names you may not even heard of, and that's why I love going down here. The first one that stood out, Tukey Brown, five eleven point guard, 189 pounds out of Georgia Southern. Uh, he's he's basically a Muncie Bogues type, uh, very crafty. He's a little, obviously he's not five three, but he's a little bit taller. But he has that same type of defensive potential. And that's what jumped out at me. He literally got the guys 94 feet and gave a lot of point guards a lot of trouble just to make it past half court. Uh, he's he's very crafty on that end, very, and he's strong. He's not like a slight type little point guard. You know, when they try to use their size against them, they weren't even strong. Bigger guards weren't even strong enough to outmuscle them. So he could become a pest. And I think that's his ticket to trying to get in to get on the NBA rail as far as earning a roster spot, two way deal, getting into the G League, something like that. Uh, but it's not just that. He can shoot it. He's efficient. He shot 49% from the season last year. Uh, he averaged 17 points, four assists, four rebounds. Um, you know, he, he, he was fearless, man. And he's a, capable, he's a capable finisher. He has a lot of ways to score inside. Um, he's the first four-time Sun Belt first team honor, honoree. Like, when I say that, let me repeat that four times. Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year. He made the first team in his conference. 
that just tell you how devastating and how talented he is. But he, he, you know, he's a problem, man. And immediately when I saw Muggsy Bowles, if he can have that type of efficiency offensively and bring that defense impact, oh, he'll be on the NBA on roster soon enough. Another guy that you definitely have heard of, Chris Clemens. Led the nation to score on 30 a game. You know, 5'9 point guard, 180 pounds out of Campbell. Uh, he was that he won MVP, led the team to the championship. Remember, I told y'all last time we was here last week. When you win the championship, that matters. You know that shows the win, especially how hard they get after throughout the week. So if you endure the grind that leads your team to the championship, that impresses a lot of scouts, and that's exactly what he did. He didn't shoot well all the time, but he made enough shots where you can see like yeah, he's going to be a problem. Um, the thing that jumps out at you, he, he's, he's a freak athlete. It, it's it's kind of like a combination of Earl Boykins and Nate Robinson. That's what you see. Um, you know, he's not as good of a shooter as Earl Boykins, but he when he gets hot, it, can, it comes in waves and he, he'll light you up. But he's, he's, he, he, he was basically, to me, the most talented point guard, just natural talent. I'm not going to say he's the best point guard because other guys had better feel. They knew when to shoot. They could shoot a little bit better. You know, they were more consistent, more efficient. But talent-wise, he was the most talented point guard in the show. Um, you know, he, I just think he's going to get a lot of workouts, and for sure, because he won MVP, I know he's going to be at the, you know, the, at very least the comp, the G League, E League camp, and I expect to see him at the combine as well. And um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him, at, you know, get drafted in the second round and, you know, possibly make a team. He, he's the ideal backup point guard. Then when he learns the NBA game, gets a little bit more efficient with his jump shot, he might be fighting the cracker start lineup down the road. Uh, he's the big South all time leading scorer. Um, and finished as the third time all time leading scoring in Division One history with 3,225 points. Another guy, Josh Perkins from Gonzaga, 6'3, 190 pound point guard. Uh, he, he put on the show uh, the way he can shoot and pass. Uh, I didn't know he could pass like that. I knew he was an assist guy in Gonzaga, I thought he was just playing the role, but his core vision is unreal. Um, he could, he could, I mean, the way he was throwing it was, I, I don't want to compare him to Jason Kidd, but that's kind of what jumps out at you. I mean, I saw him get an outlet pass and literally throw it behind a back bounce pass through traffic <laughs> to his center for the dunk. I mean, it, it, that's what he was doing. He was now, seeing he, stuff happen that early? Yeah, it, it, his vision is not real now. He could be turnover prone because he takes chances, but you live with it because most of the time he completes the play. And he can, he, he, but he's an efficient shooter, but he don't always look to score. And in this day and age, we got a lot of scoring point guards. It's kind of refreshing to see a guy more focused on running the team or whatnot. But, you know, you can see why he's Gonzaga's all-time leading scorer. It's simple. So they need a backup point guard to come in, run the show, play great defense, and, you know, you know shoot the ball efficiently. He's your guy. He's a, he's a guy to kind of look at. Another guy about the same, Alex Robinson. Damn, never heard of him. Uh, point guard, 6'1", 180 pounds, out of Texas Christian. Similar to Josh Perkins, he's a pass first point guard. He's a little bit smaller, but he's a better athlete. He's more explosive. Um, he is nothing for him to catch lobs and get in there and get in the lane and try to dunk on the bigger, you know, bigger bigs and centers and whatnot. Uh, he loves to find his teammates first and second, then looks to the score. Um, he has to improve finishing inside. Sometimes the trees do bother him. He missed a lot of money, open monies, but the fact that he can get there. That's 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 most of the work right there. He just got to put the ball in the hole. And I like the way he gets out on defense. That's one thing I also saw this year. A lot of point guards weren't scared to go up against other top-tier point guards and get out there defensively. And you have to because it's real at the league. I mean, you can't – there are no nights off. you got to be able to defend. And we see it all year. When you don't defend, it looks bad because these guys are too good. They embarrass you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, he finished seventh in the nation assist, dishing out 6.9 assists per game. You know, at TCU. Last but not least, Justin Robinson out of Virginia Tech. You know, he was the first episode of the Pro. I kind of highlighted. 6'2", 195 pounds. He got hurt late in the year, kept bounce back, helped him, you know, make try to make a run in the tournament. But uh, no point guard was more poison and tough than him throughout the week. Uh, you know, those traits were never more obvious than what you probably saw when the show opened uh, in the very first game. He was off the whole game. I think he was like 2 for 11 at one point. But he finished 3 of 12. He had the biggest shot. The game went a three-pointer and opened the game. And there was no hesitation, confidence, same thing. Uh, a lot of people forget he was one of the most efficient three-point shooters in the ACC last year. So with that being said, and then the way he runs the team, he's poised. He don't get sped up. He's a tough defender. He can find an open man. When you add all those qualities, he's the ideal backup point guard. 
that you would want on your team. And he's battle tested, obviously playing in the ACC. Yep. So I definitely expect him to, you know, definitely expect him to see at the combine and on the NBA roster and again drafting the second round on the NBA roster next year. Um, being a backup point guard and then trying to develop and get a starting role, you know, he he definitely shine with that. All right, so before we take this quick break, because we can, um, <laughs> shameless plug, get over to Finest Bag YouTube channel, also my model sports YouTube channels. Check out the pro man. The first episode with Justin Robinson was so much fun. Um, Cardell's added upon that. We had some more good probe episodes. I think we're up to like four now, right? Yes, sir. So uh, y'all definitely want to definitely get it started, watch them in order. But we're going to take a quick break when we get back, Cardell's. We're going to move on to the wings. You're watching the Phobies TV. Welcome back to the Focus TV. All right, Cardell. Back at it. Um, the wings. Yeah, the wings. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was some wings. I'm going to start off with a guy, another guy I never heard of. Um, he actually played at Montrose Christian before it closed down here for a year. His name is Jarrell Brantley. Uh, he played forward at College of Charleston, 6'7", 255-pound wing. Um, He's a man child. <laughs> what do you sound like one? I know. The best way I can describe him, he has guard skills, but he has the body of Anthony Mason's. But he's athletic. Oh. He's a freak. They couldn't do nothing with him. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> they couldn't do nothing. They couldn't do nothing with him. They couldn't do nothing with him. They couldn't do he was that right on his feet? He's a guard. He's a two guard, but he's. But remember, Anthony Mason's like he just ain't have a lot of bounce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this dude got bounce like head in the room. He, he's a problem, man. Uh, he's a combination of a shooting guard and skill and, a and athleticism, but in a power for his body. Uh, he was a mismatch all week for defenders. Uh, when they put a guard on him, he just body him, get to a spot. He too big, old bully him, get to the lane, get to the free throw line. If they put a big on him, that's when he went to guard mode, you know, crossovers, step back jumpers, three pointers in transition. And he, he he's a dog. He got a lot of confidence. He was, he was telling them what he, what he was doing while he was doing it. He's one of those guys, and I love it. Um, he, he, that's why I think he got a shot at the league because he will always have a mismatch no matter who he's playing against. Um, you know, during the season at College of Charleston, he was a uh, daily efficient, averaged 19 points on 51% shooting from the field while grabbing eight boards. But the thing that surprised me, when you look at his body, you, you probably want to think he would be able to defend. But he could defend. He could stay with guards. He can get down there, bang with bigs in the post, and hold his own. And that's why I think he's he's probably the most intriguing player that was there at, at Portsmouth. Because if he get with the right team, I'm that, already yeah. If he get with the right pro, like the right organization, somebody that's known for developing players and putting them in the right spots, he he could be the surprise uh, in this year's class. Because he definitely got the tools, but it's just a matter of it, you know. If somebody he gets the right organization, because as you can see with some organizations, he gets in the wrong organization, he's just gonna be there. But again, you know, if so he gets to the right one, is it to get ugly. 7, 6, 7, 255. And mm -hmm. it ain't out of shape. Too. It, <laughs> it's serious. <laughs> it's serious, man. I mean, seeing him, like, we was in there, we was talking about it. We just, like, I feel sorry for guys that don't hit the weight room because he going to bully him. He going to tear him up. And, like, and, I, and don't be surprised to hear him during draft time. Dude's ducking him. Yeah. Like, he, he become this year's John Wick, like how Javon Carter was yeah. last year. We don't want no parts of that. We canceling the workout because mm -hmm. he's going to prevent him from moving up or yeah. them dropping. That's how they leave him. The only question I had, when you talk about the size and him getting to a spot where he has the guard, the, the babies on him. Right. Um, He already got, like, a little post game already to go with it? Yeah, he's a cool. bully, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. He scored over 2,000 points in his career, yeah. He's, 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 he's a problem, so... Uh, another name that people probably should around here should know about him, Ahmed Hill, um, out of Virginia Tech, six five two ten guard, one of the more athletic players on hand. If you saw on Twitter, had him warm ups, going between his legs with the off hands. Uh, he gets after defensively like a Patsy Beverly, but he's bigger, and more athletic. Yeah, so ninety four feet, he was rooting, he was getting on. Hey, he was getting on Justin Robinson, all those guys. He ain't care, you know. And I love that about him. But the thing is, with his lockdown potential, he has some potential to be a lockdown defender at the next level. He can score. People forget. He's the, people don't even realize 
He's the all-time leading scorer in high school out of Georgia. Not Lou Williams. Not all these other great players. I Dominique Wilkins. I mean, Dominique was playing North Carolina, but yeah, out of state of Georgia in high school. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you know, Josh Smith. Not Lou Williams. Not Lou Dwight Howard. Wilkins. It's him. So over three thousand points in his career. So, um, you know, he can hit threes at an efficient at an efficient rate. He can he can dang sure slash with the best of them. Finish strong in traffic. The only thing I'm looking at as an off guard, can he make guys better? You know, finding them when they open and stuff like that. That's the only thing I'm kind of waiting to see. That's the only thing that kind of holds him back. But you can get that, you know. So, um, you know, he definitely going to have his opportunities to, you know, potentially crack a roster. Uh, Daquan Jeffries, he might have been the best athlete in, 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 at the PIT. If you follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and if you read this article on the PLT I posted, you probably saw him dunking on Chris Silver from South um, South Carolina. He literally punching it on him. And he dunked on him twice. I missed the second one, you know what I'm saying? Where he shammed God, one of the defenders. Yeah, he shammed God on the break, took two steps, and Chris Silver was hustling, trying Shame to get them to the bomb. Yeah, it, it's on the PLT. Go and post yeah. it on Twitter. It's on there, and he dunked on him. So he did that all week. He was dunking on dudes all week, 6'5", 230-pound wing out of, out of Tulsa. Um, but his efficiency scoring the balls was stood out. He knows what he is. He's not really crafty with the ball, trying to score off, the, um, score off the bounce. But he knows what he is. He gets to his spots, and he he knocks down shots when he gets to his spots. If he ever gets a handle, becomes more shifty and everything, it can get very ugly. He has NBA size, NBA athleticism. He can score good enough. And with his athleticism, he's a, he's a, he's a, he wants to defend. He don't. He, he don't shy away from that. He don't care if it's a wing or a big. He'll go down there and battle. You know, once he get, you know, more crafty in his offensive game as far as, you know, off the bounce, you know, he'll have his chance. And he's fairly young, man. He don't turn 22 till August. So, um, you know, I expect to see him in one of those two camps and, you know, fighting for a spot. Another local guy, another pro subject, James Palmer Jr. out of Nebraska, 6'6", 200, pound, 200 pounds. He, um, out of the area, played at St. John's. Like like we said in pro man, he's a Swiss Army knife wing who brings a lot to the table. He's a sneaky athlete. He 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 may not jump out out at you right away, but if you fall asleep, he he will embarrass you. Uh, he can play the one or the three because he has a lot of length. He's he's one of the, the the few guards that had like a crazy wingspan. I think he had like a six nine wingspan or something like that. So even when he gets beat, uh, he still can recover, contest shots. I've seen him routinely get on guards, half court. Like, if he ain't get the full rip, he would knock the ball loose and stuff. Even when he was out of position because of his left, they would try to dribble past him, cross him up, and he would last second knock the ball away. And that's what I think, you know, I could see him being in at the next level, just a consistent two-way threat. Um, he finished third team all, all Big Ten last year, and uh, I think he's going to be highly sought after doing the pre-draft evaluation, you know, getting workouts. And depending on how that do, he might be able to sneak into the second round as well. Josh Reeves, another local kid, you know, played at Paul the Six, uh, six four, two hundred ten point guard out of Penn State. Uh, he at Penn State he was known as an athletic defender with a high motor. He loves to compete, but what he showed at PIT, he can hit the jumper now. He was hitting three pointers, uh, off the bounce, transition, on the move, and that 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 just opened a lot of folks' eyes. They didn't know he had that in him. That's why I love going down there because because in college systems, you may not be in a position to show everything you can do. But then out there, if you want to see you play, show it. You know, why you holding back anyway? You trying to get in the league, why, why hold back? And he did it. I mean, he went from being a late addition to be, being on the all Portsmouth team at the end of the camp. So he definitely going to get his opportunities for real. Um, Mario Shayok, guard, 6'5", 202 out of Iowa State. He's a bit old. He's 24 years old. He, he, he started at Virginia, then he transferred to Iowa State. But I don't think that should scare NBA personnel. Uh, he was one of the more consistent scorers at Portsmouth. Uh, he's a legit NBA scorer. Uh, he uh, he can score from all three levels. He can post up. He can shoot with range off the bounce, spotting up. Uh, he can shoot uh, on the move. He's six five with a seven foot wingspan, and I think he had a game high individual game high for this year with 37 points in the first game. And if you go on my Twitter as well, on IG, you see him hitting the game to send the game into overtime, hitting the three-point to send the game into overtime, and then hitting the game winner to win the game. Mm-hmm. So he's fearless. The only concern with him, that boy can get tunnel vision. Like, he don't see nothing else but me getting buckets, though. He, he, <laughs> he ain't afraid to jack. Like, like <laughs> you got to chill, man. But, 
you know, <laughs> but when he's on, it's special. He, 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 can, he can fill it up real quick, man. But once he learns what's a good shot, what's, what's a bad shot, um, he'll be fine at the next, next level. But it's, it's similar to what it is, man. What makes you great can sometimes be to your detriment yeah. if you don't check it. And that's just something he, he got to learn, you know. But I think he will, you know. So, yeah, I, I definitely expect him to see him being drafted in the second round or on the roster next year. He, he could just score too good, too experienced. And Quindary Weatherspoon, another guy I've never heard of. He jumped out at me, 6'4", 210-pound guard out of Mississippi State. Uh, he came in with a reputation as a scorer, um, averaging 18 points per game last year. But his all-around game is what caught my attention. He really had no holes. He can handle, he can pass, he can shoot, he can defend. It was he, He's just good in every aspect. And he, and he got after it on both ends. Just because you are capable of playing that, that don't mean guys normally try to do both ends, mm-hmm. try to play both ends. And he, he did. Um, he, 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 he rebounded well, went up with the trees, got key rebounds, offensive boards. He just understands how to play basketball. And that was totally the opposite of what, you know, we heard about him coming in, reading up on him, stuff like that. And that's why I always say, I hear what people say and all that, but go see for yourself because – you just don't know what angle people are talking about. So, you know, he measured at 6'4 shoes, but he has a 6'9 wingspan also, and which makes it him effective shooting over taller wings, even though he's 6'4, similar to Dwayne Wade and everything like that. So, uh, don't be shocked to see him competing at the Chicago Combine. All right, so we got point guards, we got wings. Yeah, Let's get into this court. front court, man. All right, you know, not as many names, but Zach Hankins, center, 6'11 center, 245 pounds out of Xavier who's actually from, um, he was a transfer from a D2 school. Uh, he came in with a lot of questions, Mark. They ain't know what to expect. You know, it was doubts about his jumper and athleticism. I ain't see that. I saw him dunking on dudes all week. I don't know what, what the doubts were. I mean, he, he was dunking. It was quick. He got the ball. He went up, and he put dudes in the basket. And mid-range, he was able to knock down shots, screens, pick and pop. He was knocking down jumpers. And, and he, he showed he had a post game. He was hitting hooks over both shoulders, both hands. No matter who was, I mean, he was even scoring on, um, what's my man, uh, Christ Cooper J from uh, Florida State, the 7'4 dude. He, yeah. was, he was scoring over him. Well, if you score over him with his height and length, you should be fine in the league. So I, I have no doubts about his ability to play in the league. I could see him easily getting a two way deal being on the team, back and forth between the G League development and stuff like that. And once they get, you know, the NBA personnel get, get their hands on him, help him develop, change his body, diet, he can easily stick in the league, man. He just has, he's too big and agile, and he understands how to play. And the one thing I love about him, he runs the floor like a man. man. Like, he, he he got the rebound outlet to hit, beat everybody down the floor for an easy dunk or lay-in. Uh, he's going to find work. Exactly, find just work. by doing that. So. Uh, definitely keep an eye on him. Zach Hankins out of Xavier. Eric Holman, another 6'11 center out of Mississippi State. Um, he's a little on the slender side, but he more than held his own in the paint. He's tough. He'll bang with you. Uh, but he's, he's a solid athlete at 6'11, solid finisher inside, who also displayed a soft, a soft touch shooting the ball from mid range. And he can also step out and shoot the ball from three point range at 6'11. Um, you know, he's a capable scorer off the bounce. He has a lot of perimeter skills for his size, being 6'11, that were hidden when he was at Mississippi State. And the thing is, he came in basically known as a rebounder and shot blocker. But this event allows you to explore your game. And once you see everything he has, his potential, it, he, he, it, two-way deal is easy. You know, his, 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 his blend of skill, size, and athleticism and toughness, why would you pass that up? You know, it's just a matter if he want to take that or possibly go overseas. Or if he killing workouts, who knows? He might be able to sneak into the second round. It's really all there for him. It's just a matter of how he put in the work over the next couple months. And Nick Perkins, I mean, this dude, man, oh, my God, like 6'8", 250 out of Buffalo. He on a, he, he, he was the sixth man of the year in his conference. But this how daily he – this is, he led his team in points and rebounds during the event. Keep in mind, like I said, during the season, he was the sixth man. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, he was the sixth man. Okay. He was the sixth man. But he's a beast. He knows exactly what he is. He's a relentless rebounder. Guys bounce off of him. But it's his work on the block that impressed me, man. His work on the block was crazy. He's a lefty. He's athletic. He has no problem dunking on you. He can hit three-pointers. He steps out here in the mid-range. He got moves off the bounce, too. So, if you, you know, when you see him post up, you're worried about his strength. So, you might be trying to gear up for that, and he'll give you a little quick spin, oh, yeah. reverse pivot and all that stuff. He got all that with him to keep you guessing and everything. And then when you trying to catch up with him, then that's when he put his strength on you, and then it's a wrap. 
He, you know, he shot thirty-seven percent from three-point range last season. I definitely expect to see him in the league. He's just too. He remind me of uh, a more athletic Kyle O'Quinn that came out of Norfolk State a few years ago. Okay. But he, but he has more athleticism with him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the one thing about Kyle O'Quinn that keeps him kind of where he is. He's he, skilled. Yeah. 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 He's skilled. Yeah. And tough, but his athleticism and that this dude got the athleticism to match all that. So he he he, he could be a better Kyle O'Quinn for sure. Man, there's a couple players you were talking about where it just sounded like I'm, I can't wait to see where they land because, again, good, good organizations. They gonna, they develop. Hey, people yeah. out there watching, go go look them up. Yeah. You'll see. Like so, Brantley and those guys. Yeah. Hey. hey, get over to finestmag.com as always. Um, you know, <laughs> wealthy information over there. Right. Give it over to mymonosports.com as well. But uh, outstanding job with the pit. I, I know you enjoy it each and every year, man. We enjoy uh you know, last week you guys got to hear about it before it. Mm-hmm. Then you got the recap. Still get over to find it mad because there's still so much more content. Yeah, we got That's photos, a, highlights, yeah. comments a lot. Right. It's four days. Y'all know when anytime we, we go to stuff, it's it's not a one medium thing. We come back with several layers of content. But we're gonna continue on with this show. As promised, we have some more things to go. I tell you, I'm anxious to hear who you have to who you have your counterparts in MC East pick, picking. Absolutely. Obviously, no there's one team <laughs> that doesn't get to pick, so it's fine. They know what their first round pick is. Uh, and Amari Cooper, but we're going to get there a little bit later. This week on the 9450, Jamal Hayward, a counter move to a fadeaway jumper, add a pump fake, and a drag dribble for separation. So I'm going to run that back. It's a counter move to a fadeaway jumper, add a pump fake, and a drag dribble for separ- a drag dribble. For separation. Trav, make sure you got all of that. Right there, there. I'm trying to imagine it in my head. I'm like, okay. All right. And then also, <laughs> shout out to Capital City Go Go Ford, Isaiah Armwood, helping out with the demo for this week's installment of 9450. After that, we'll take a quick break. And on the other side of that, we're going to talk about DC United. Things didn't go so well at home this past weekend. Welcome back to the Focus TV. Uh, I tell you, giving us some playoff NBA playoff updates. Got it. During gotcha. the break, uh, shout out to y'all on IG tuning in as well. We appreciate it. Whether you're tuning in on Tuesday or on Friday on DC TV, either way, good great for you guys taking awesome. time to spend, uh, you know, spend this hour with us. All right, for DC United, um, it just wasn't a good loss. It wasn't a good day. Uh, they got beat by a team that was desperate to get their first win of the season, and New York's NYCFC came out and did just like. Uh, and did just that. Uh, one of the things a team's going through, you know, Cardell, you talk all the time, one of your favorite things that I've adopted is, you know, when a scout report catches up to you. Yep. So, you know, last year we saw this run DC United made to, to close the year, Audi opened, they were on like 12. Um, we got to see that, that, that beautiful connection between Luciano Acosta and Wayne Rooney. Um, it's clear that teams this year, what, you're not, what they're looking at DC United, like what you're not gonna do, mm-hmm is we're not going to allow those two to get going. Like, we got to break up that connection. Right. So others have to beat us. Um, 
so what they're struggling with, Joseph Moore went down and starting right back. And since then, things have just been a little bit off. As expected, you know, if you miss a piece in any type of machinery, things run a little bit differently. Um, that's hurt DC United a little bit. They, they, they've yet to find, like, a true viable option um, at that position. They've had some people step in. Against NYC FC, they had Paul Ariola step back there for at least the first half. And while he can play back there, it hurt their attack. So, akin to, like... Again, akin to a team having really good slashers or playmakers that need shooters to open up the floor, uh, Paul Ariola with his speed does that for Rooney and Acosta, giving them an outlet where they can put that ball out wide and then he can just come screaming down the side and put added stress so it loosens things up in the middle. When he's playing in the back, he's not able to do that as much, so the attack's different. So now you can clog up that space. You can really make sure that connection between Rooney and Acosta is just not happening. Right. You, you can literally just jump those two, right? Mm -hmm. And right now, the thing is for BC United is trying to find a way for others. Someone's going to have to step up and be more of a creator, be a little bit more, um, be a little bit more ag aggressive and assertive as a facilitator. I do think they have a, one person that comes to mind. I do think Lucas Rodriguez can provide that for them. Um, mm -hmm. That's the youngster they got this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about him being assertive enough to do it. I, and I know, like, almost by default, you know, you got great players on – the field, on the court, what have you, you're going to want to play through them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those things where the, it's a long year. DC United is going to have to figure out where the others have to open things up for them at times. You know, make the teams pay for the attention they're giving to those two. So that's just something they're going to have to work on. And I do think one of the things why they try to figure this out in this little bit of a rough patch is that Areola just can't play in the back right now because it just shrinks things for the opposition. And you just can't have that. Uh, so... Another thing that happened, Griffin Gow, 16-year-old homegrown, he got his first MLS, you know, he got his first minutes in MLS uh, in his MLS career. So shout out to that youngster. You know, obviously, you know, his mop-up minutes or whatnot, but still got a chance just to experience it. You're 16. You made your pro debut. It is what it is. Yeah. Shout out to you. Um, the biggest thing here is I just want everybody to not overreact. Like, it's a long season. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is why DC United hasn't played ex exceptionally well or very well at all in their last three home games, or at least as, uh, as well as they would have liked to play, they, they've yet to lose on the road. So they're still in first place in the East at this moment, but this week is a tough week for them. So they just played on Sunday. Um, tomorrow, <laughs> they're in Columbus. And then Sunday, they're in Minnesota before returning home. So they got a chance, even with you know, the, the struggles at home, if they can get six points out of this week right here, get two wins, you're still atop the Eastern Conference. Life is fine. You just have to get through this period in which, obviously, you would like Joseph Moore to come back as soon as possible so the things, so everything becomes whole again. Because the other thing that Moore does is he joins the attack, and it's another person that can make plays for others and add stress to a defense. So I just want people to remember it's a very long year. Like We're like eight games in. Like life's going to be okay. If you, think about, like, if you think about how last season started, uh, I think you take this easily. Um, but, you know, and the other thing is Acosta still hasn't gotten into, he hasn't had, it looks like he hasn't gotten into him being himself yet this season. Despite that, again, you're four. <laughs> I think you're four, two, and two at the moment, so you're still okay. Like, mm -hmm. it's, don't need to panic or anything. Just take care of business this week and you'll be fine. Um, Columbus is in fourth place in the East, and then Minnesota's in fifth place. Uh, those are the two teams they're playing this week. NBA playoffs. I uh, just want to get you guys' thoughts on how you feel everything's going, what's, what's, what's jumping out at you. I know you, you brought up a couple <laughs> scores already, Octavia. So what's happening on that side? How do you feel about this first round? I mean, it's been impressive, and then it's been – there's sometimes some games I just been like, this is bad. Um, but the one thing that I – even though they got swept, like, I know y'all saw the dunk. Because they played it like 50,000 times. You talk about? Uh, the Pacers and Celtics game. Oh, you talk about Miles oh, Turner. Yeah. I've replayed it myself like 10 times. Because. 10 times? Probably. Okay. Um, I, I give the Pacers a lot of credit. Even though I feel like they could have stole a game in that series. I feel like they should have stole a game in that series. They played well enough to at least win one. Um, it was kind of far-fetched to think that they were really going to win the series. But I definitely think that they should have been able to steal at least one game. 
Um, and you can see how much they miss, you know, Victor Oladipo, although a lot of the other supporting cast definitely stepped up, you know, to try their best to get them through the first round of the playoffs. Um, but, it, I mean, Kyrie was on one for the majority of the, the whole, if not the whole um, four games, because I don't really think he had a really, really bad game in any of those. Um, so, but that was a sweep for them, the only sweep so far, which – I'm kind of surprised, but not surprised. Um, i trying to think what else stood out to me. Utah finally won a game. Mm -hmm. um, they should have won their last game. Um, it would have made it a more competitive series a little bit. I mean, although they're, it's 3-1 now. So they got a long way to go. But it could be done mathematically. So, um, I'm interested to see it. Like, Donovan Mitchell, although I feel like he hasn't played up to his potential for majority of the series, you can tell that he's just the type of player that's just going to keep playing. And and I love that about him. Like, no matter how much he missed, no matter how much, you know, everything is going terrible, he's always going to give it 100%, but he's not going to do too much. Sometimes he does, don't get me wrong, but he's not going to take it overboard like – all right, I missed my last five shots. I'm about to shoot another five shots, even if there's a better shot that's open for somebody else. Um, I don't see him as that type of player. I just feel like he has a high motor, and he just want to win. And you can tell that, like, he don't want to go out like this. And I appreciate that. And you can tell that in the game last night because I haven't honestly haven't made it through a full late-night game because – 11.30, I'm tired. <laughs> so, so, it get rough. But I stayed up and watched last night, you know, and it was impressive to see them, you know, especially because they were ahead and then they lost it again. And then um, to kind of gain their composure back again to, to finally, you know, get that W um, was, a I think, it was a great game. All right, Cardo. Um, you know, we're getting closer to some teams finishing off series. We, we had a team already finished things last night in Milwaukee. Um, you know, just your thoughts, either heading into round two or just on round one. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of just looking at the OKC Portland series. Yeah, um, yeah that's what I'm watching. I like, what Dame, I like what Dame and CJ are doing. They're not getting caught up in a hoop a lot. They're playing their game. Mm -hmm. um, they're, showing a, they're showing leadership. Yeah. And that's what, what people criticize Russ a lot of. Russell, OKC fans think you're questioning his talent. It's never his talent. It's never mm -hmm. the way he competes. That's what people love about him. It's his maturity and leadership as a point guard. Last game, they shouldn't have lost that game. It should actually be 2-2 going back to Portland. Uh, even though Dane was going off in the third quarter, that quarter just kind of was – it basically symbolizes Russell Westbrook in a sense. Whereas, you, why are you all settling for hero three-pointers jacking and – just, like at one point midway through the third they were one for eight from three they're one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the league and you know this what when they came here and stuff throughout the regular season what made them special was when they hung their hat on defense most of the year remember paul george was in defensive player of the year conversation mm -hmm. jeremy grant emerged adams it, they was lead, they was leaning their hat on that end and then coming to the offense which made it easier Exactly. And then, like, towards the end of the season, you kind of saw them just just get away from that. It became yeah. – they they trying to play like everybody else, three-point shooting and everything. You got to play to your identity. And I think that's their advantage. Think about it. Like, Adams only averaging, what, eight shots a game? And that ain't it. And Cantor is not even a good defensive center. And um, uh, Kirstick is not even there. Nurkic, or whatever. He's, he's out. So, what if you get Cantor in foul trouble? Then there's no one to rebound. Then they go in with a lot of four or three, some, or like small fours playing the center. Then he can eat, which opens things up. Russ, you won the last game. The very game that they won, the very last game before last when they lost. They won that game because Paul George and Russell Westbrook closed the game, killing those dudes in the mid and low post. So why are y'all coming down the very next game, Jack and Threes, trying to shoot with Dame and CJ? That's their strength. That's what they do. You see what I'm saying? But even then, they don't just come down just jack for no reason. They may jack when they in rhythm, they hot, or this within the flow of the offense. But mainly, they mixing it up. They get in the mid-range. They going to the bucket, getting fouled, going to the free throw line. They find the other guys. It wasn't just C and Dane that went off in the third quarter. Alfred Rucamino hit some big shots. Collins came in, got some key buckets, some key dunks. Harkless woke up a little bit. And then, and then CJ took him out in the fourth quarter. 
and he was pretty much the most consistent player for Portland all game. Mm-hmm. And 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 that's why I'm looking at Russell, man. All that acting out, all that. You gotta check that, homie. It's, it, it goes back to what I said earlier. What makes you great can also be to your detriment if you don't check it. And that's working to his detriment. He's so competitive. It's just like I'm gonna beat you at your own game, nah, dog. Like you can't beat Steph Curry shooting the ball. You're gonna lose that battle. Play your game. That's how you beat Steph Curry, and that's how you beat Dame. And Dame, to their credit, is not falling for it. And in a sense, Russell, in a sense, is kind of a bully. I'm gonna just. Yeah. But what happens? How you beat a bully? You don't let them punk you. You just stand up to them. And when you stand up to them, like Dame them are doing, they don't know how to react to that. Even Paul George, he had 30, but it was a horrible 30. It was, it was inefficient. So it was whatever. And now you you seeing a team kind of follow Russell's bad leadership. Yep. And that just shows the immaturity on him as a point guard. Like, you got to recognize, look, it, when they was one for eight, and you see Dame going off, and then Portland's creeping back in the game to take the lead, look, man, call a timeout. Hey, nobody shoot a three unless you wide open within the float offense. Paul George, get on the block. I'm on the block. Coach, if you put Schroeder, Raymond, and Felton in the, in the game, it's C.J. Dame on me, I'm in the block. I'm going to go to work. And that way you're keeping the pressure on them because even people don't understand when you're posting up, it's not just for you to score. You're so close to the basket, guys have to guard because you can easily just dish it down and dump it down and easy points, especially the ball is moving. And then you got to look at Billy Donovan. Man. What offense are y'all running? Why ain't you check? Why hasn't anybody checked Russ? Like, if Russ ain't listening, sit him down. You got, you got to do that. It's not working, bro. So, it, to me, it was more of an implosion with OKC quietly, more so than with Dame and them did. Because all they did was just play their game. They didn't yeah. really have an all-out game where they just shot lights out. They just played their game. And as time went on, the more poised team won the game. And that's what happens in the playoffs. The more poised team that stick through the, the ups and downs of that game in the playoffs, the team usually wins. And that's what you're seeing right now. And if Russ and them don't get their act together, they're going home to the crib tonight. I'm more disappointed in Russ because he, he, he's a vet, man. It, it, look, a few years ago, you can make an excuse when KD left. He young. He get time. You can't make that excuse no more. And Isaiah Thomas said something real talking to Stephen A. on the little uh, radio show. He said, I feel like Russell Westbrook and Paul George are playing to get their numbers to fool the media so they won't be criticized instead of playing to win the game. And that's, and that's you see a lot of players do that. They get their numbers so you can't blame them. But no, nah, we saw how you played. And you, no, nah, you know, look, maybe a great game for them to win. Maybe Russ may have 15 points on five or 10 shooting, but he would have 15 assists and 15 rebounds. Maybe he got to take that type of effort, with that type of game to beat Dame and them. But you coming down just jacking up bad threes and stuff, trying to match Dame and stuff like that, you're not going to win that battle. That's Dame and CJ's strength, and they're going to laugh at you. And I heard and, and just seeing the tweets for guys that were reporting for the team where Russ had the ball, yeah. the team was yelling, yo, let him shoot, back off, just let him shoot. And you know, like you said, it's playing in that detriment. him. They know that ego, him being that competitive, you telling him, let him shoot, he's going to keep jacking. But that's immaturity. You can't feed into that, man. Play your, you play your game. Yeah. But that's, like you said, that's literally... What's happening? And I just want to give credit to Dave and CJ real quick. Cause yeah, cause they sat there last year, and they they owned up to their L's and their failures. Professional. Yes, they they sat there. They took they answered every question about back to back years. They got swept back to back years. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um. They were the third seed again. Shout out for getting back there. CJ for rehabbing and just being out there right now. Period. And what I like about them is you're you're you have to play the Blazers now. You know, it, it's not just Dame and CJ anymore. Yeah. And I just want to shout out, you know, just credit them for their growth. And that's why when we did our NBA teams, I had CJ first. I mean, not CJ, Dame, Dame first yeah. team. You know, and because he earned that. Especially when CJ went down, everybody expected Portland to drop in the standings. And Dame was like, hell no, we're going to stay where we at. And, and the way that he did it, and it wasn't just by, I'm scoring, scoring more, uplifted everybody else. We saw, you know, Layman came on during that time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, just want to sh- Credit them for what they've been doing, and um, I mean, with the playoffs for me, I'm just looking forward to some. I'm looking forward to the second round matchups. Mm-hmm. I'm very much looking forward to the Boston Milwaukee matchup because yeah, some I'm of gonna y'all, say that's the only one that's set so far. Some of y'all are talking real crazy, and I'm just going. I just want to watch it. That's it. I'm, I'm gonna get crazy. Which way I'm not seeing. Boston's way, and I just want to watch yeah, it. Yeah, I heard that too. I'm, I'm excited to see that series too. I'm, I'm just sitting here looking. I think at it's just it. just more people who want rather be in Boston. You know, covering the playoffs and moving on. That, it's, it's selfish <laughs> reasons for that in the Milwaukee, but 
You know, now the narrative is, I hear people saying Milwaukee team is so much better than the Celtics um, team outside. Of, you take Greek Free Grow, their team, their supporting cast is better than Boston. I'm like, but before the season, y'all had them in the finals against the Warriors. Y'all told us how, how like, Boston's bench made a run last year, so... Nah, so, dog. I, I don't want. To, come on, now. Look, I'm ready for this second round, but they. And shout out Eric Bledsoe. Yes. He he he. Another guy that ain't played well last year in the playoffs. He he he's redeeming himself right mm-hmm. now. He's he's balling. So, you know, and shout out to Blake Griffin getting out there gunning Man. out. That was hard. That was that was something we don't really see anymore. That was like back in the old school gunning and out. Even even not only just last night from Blake, but for this year, because mm-hmm. I think yeah. for the large part, the this year was the best year to me. Yes, this was a beautiful year for him. Like, you just really watch his game really truly evolve. It, it, and it was just like everything's equal now. Not, like, first it was athleticism. Then you mix in, like, hey, I could do some other things. Now, is I could go into, I could pull whatever out of my bag whenever I want. He's an all around basketball player. Right. So. And it was beautiful. So and like, I'm waiting for Drummond to get to that level. Yeah. If he's at that level, where, where would Detroit be? And right. he's still, he's been stuck at the same level right. for the last few years. I'm mm-hmm. waiting for him to take that so next leap. Miles Turner, he's another one. If he make that leap, they possibly could have gave Boston the L without Oladipo. He got to make a leap on the other end now. Because if he reaches his potential with Oladipo coming back healthy. It's going to be fun, man. So, it's going to be kind of scary. Um, and, yeah, I don't think there's really anything else to comment on. Yeah. I mean, I Denver, and, what, Denver and San Antonio. I don't, I'm going to be honest. Season. I have not watched it. I think that's going the distance. They going I, back I think forth. that's going seven. And, uh, shout out to you two because you pointed that, I want to say, like two shows ago about joking being more aggressive. Yeah, and that's literally been the difference in the wins. And then, you know, in the he, he has to. Sometimes when you're aggressive, it's not just about you scoring. Especially in the playoffs, if you're going against a counterpart that's equally as good yeah. or maybe better or a little slightly less or whatever, like an Aldridge, when you're aggressive, it keeps him occupied. Like, he got to deal with you. That takes away from him. Like, sometimes a strong offense is a great defense, you know, because yes. you can't stop it. You take away their legs, they can't stop you. It is what it is, man. So, you know, you got to look at that. But he has to remain aggressive because when he's aggressive, then the doubles and stuff come in. Then he do what he does best. Like they have to. He crash. Guys. Help has to come in. He's such a good passer. He's, right. So, um, that series is fun. And then just watching the Spurs just routinely. Be the Spurs. Yeah. No matter <laughs> what's plugged into that equation, you know, they, they, they find a way. They ain't around for their money right yeah. now, though. No, nah, they definitely are. Because um, of the Rows and losing, because we get kicked out the game. That composure there. Like, hey. so, I mean, we've seen that across. There's been a lack of composure for the most part in this first round. For <laughs> yeah, everybody. Several teams. Uh, shout out to Portland. Them dudes been kind of really, uh, okay, I don't agree with the call. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me go back to play. All right, so real quick, I'd say we're going to get into this whole NFL draft thing. It happens a couple days away from all this. It is. So I want to ask you, going through the NFC East, yes. at least in the first round, right, mm-hmm. who do you feel the Giants – the Redskins, and then obviously your Eagles should take. Well, I mean, let's just be get straight to the point with the Giants. They need to draft a quarterback. Like, um, I don't off top. Need off, to? off, need to off bucks. Need to oh off bucks. Okay, completely. Which one? Um, whichever one they can get. Oh wow. I'm sure it's better than what they got. Wow, you're not wow. a you're not a fan of Eli's video, the promo video that came out this past week. Didn't see it. Won't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I, mean, it, <laughs> I sat there and watched it. And then you were mad, right? Okay, so first props to the editor for the video. Because <laughs> it kept you entertained and then you realized I'm not watching anything. So I felt bad afterwards. I mean, no disrespect to Eli's pedigree and, and the games he's played, you know, over his career. He's a he's a Super Bowl Super Bowl champion, so I can't talk too ill about him, but it's always that point where I feel like you get to that 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 point and it's like all right now you, you i feel like you're damaging your legacy like you i don't want that to be the i don't want last year and whatever's about to happen this year to be the last thing that we see but what do you say bad teams do bad things so it's no telling um there's been a couple of you know different mock drafts and everything about who they'll take um right now they aren't slated to take a quarterback um, with their six-round pick. Um, uh, right now, the mock draft is leaning toward Ed Oliver. We'll see. I think they do still need more defensive pieces as well. I still think they need a good wide receiver. 
um, a proven wide receiver, you know, that they feel like can jump in and go to work right now. Don't they have, um, what's it called? Didn't they get your boy Golden Tate over there? That's how you feel? Okay, cool. Right. I mean, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I like Golden. Do but you? I don't know if he's still a number one. Okay. I'm not saying he can't be. <laughs> Just don't know if he is right now. Um, so, you know, I still think they need that. You know, they got what they got. Who they got? Golden and Sterling. Golden and Sterling. You still got Ingram the tight end. Saquon's pretty much. I mean, Saquon is enough, to be honest, because he's ridiculous. But um, that's what they're saying. I still think they need to get a, you know, quarterback. But what do I know? Um, Washington Redskins. Mm-hmm. Another team that needs a quarterback. <laughs> Um, there's already been talks, you know, if Dwayne Haskins is still available, mm -hmm. um, when he gets to their pick, which the you think Reds, they should trade up, I guess is my question. I think they should. Okay. Cause Yo, it's, it's, you already shaking your head up. I mean, I think, I think they should, if they plan on, if they really want to go, you know, into the season, like this is not a rebuilding season. Mm -hmm. I feel like if they feel like it's, this process is going to drag out for a while, there's other pieces that they could probably get before that and hope that Case Keenum and Colt McCoy, if he comes back with the leg, I don't know where he is in his rehab or whatever, if they're able to at least. Because you know Case Keenum can at least run a team. You know, it's not like it's going to be horrible. It might not be great. McCoy just had a procedure. Like another one. On the same leg, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So like he's out for these workouts coming up. So he just then had who, who – you who was behind them. Case? You got to talk to them. Exactly. Back to my point. They need a backup quarterback. Trade for Carson Wentz and keep it Absolutely not. So, exactly. like I said, they <laughs> probably do need to trade up <laughs> and move on up because they need one. But if he's still there, it's already basically a done deal. And everybody said that that's where they're going to go. Right now, they currently have the 15 pick. Mm -hmm. You know, even in this mock draft, it still has Haskin being available at that pick, so we'll never know until Thursday rolls around. So, so for you, so far, Giants and they Washington both quarterbacks. Basically. So the only people that don't need a quarterback in the division is you guys and the Cowboys. Yeah. If they cool. trade it, will you take the first round pick from the? I mean, I still or? think I still think at least for my Eagles, they'll get one, but. I'm just talking about first round. First yeah, round. yeah. No. I was like, no, not. I, I, I still wholeheartedly believe that we need a running back. I okay, really so, do. So we, you brought y'all up. Well, what are y'all taking in the first round? Hopefully a running back. You want to take running back that high? Nothing I else. take that back. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just know we need one. So you went for picks and build your team. <laughs> just for that. It's so for me and and, and the Eagles because I take it so personally. It's so hard for me to decide because I feel like we need a lot of things, okay, a lot of pieces, but I feel like they're all equal. Like there's a lot there's there's a lot of talk about you know uh, Jacobs and uh, all these other running backs and, and what they want to do. The Eagles haven't selected a running back past. A, beyond the fourth round like they've only drafted running backs from the fourth round back they haven't got anybody in the first three rounds since 2009 when they drafted shady so the eagles are really content on finding another gem later on in the rounds and not using that pick on a position like that i just i agree but i still wholeheartedly believe we need one i do know they did get uh power from the bears um, I still don't know what's going on with uh, Ajayi. How you, you don't feel good like about Howard though, like I you, do. Like that's that's enough for you to not still want to run it back. You still want if it's, but it's just him, right? Who else? I mean, I think got, Darren still hasn't know if he's coming back. I still Howard don't really like. I, I still don't really like Wendell Smallwood. I'm sorry, he did one. well. Uh, um, I like I like it's two of them. I, I like Corey Clement. They I don't feel like they do. Okay. But then the other one is Josh Jacob. No, a Adams. Adams. It's, okay. it's somebody else in there. And it's okay. all, all their names are the same in my head. But you don't feel like that's enough right there, though, that, that group of... I, I personally don't like Wendell Smallwood. Yeah, you've made that. Um, <laughs> and I still don't... I, I just feel like with Darren, it's still back and forth if he's going to retire. If he's not going to retire, is he going to be healthy? Because he wasn't healthy all last year anyway. What type of version of him are we going to get going forward? 
So it's just, to me, it's a lot of question marks. I still feel like we need um, probably the biggest outside of me winning the running back is going to be the offensive line, defensive line. I really think offensive line more so because a lot of our offensive linemen are getting up there in age. They're getting hurt more. There's a lot going on. So y'all on the clock. What position are y'all taking Jesus in the Christ. first round? I'm not in, I don't want to be in that war room <laughs> office. I do not. All right. So, all right, so <laughs> but I would go, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All right. So Sorry. then with the Ravens, what, what do you feel like for the Ravens is just ask the room here? What would y'all like them I'm to? I'm sorry, my focus on my Broncos. Y'all can continue. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and throw the NFC East and share who I think. <laughs> I was going to say, for the Ravens, with. they probably need, just need to get yeah. some good wide receivers yeah, that are run with, um, with Lamar. Like, he needs just that good core talent around him to kind of, you know, help him progress. But I agree with that wholeheartedly. All right, so going through the Giants, I agree with you that they should take a quarterback because it's Dave Gettleman. They will not take a quarterback. I know they won't. Um, <laughs> I think they're going to take Jawan Taylor, either offensive lineman or Ed Oliver, defensive defensive tackle. I, because it's Gettleman, I'm leaning towards Oliver, but their offensive line still stinks, so maybe Jawan Taylor. Um, for you guys, I had y'all taking a DB, no matter who's available right there. I think they will, too. Um, I had y'all taking Greedy if he's there, if he falls that far. If he doesn't, I like Justin Lane or Byron Murphy. For y'all, if I had to pick, I like Byron Murphy more. For the Redskins, I'm with you right there with the quarterback. I don't think Hassan's going to be there unless they trade up, up to go get him. No matter what everyone's saying to try to down him, <laughs> I think people are all one right now. Um, it sounds good, but... Mm -mm. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if he's going to be there at yeah, 15. Like, it, sounds good. <laughs> it, it sounds great. Um, I think they should go greedy. I think you need to go find... Go find you a stud in the secondary to build with Landon Collins because, like, that's your new toy. Like, your new, that's your new toy back there, right? I know you got Josh in that school, and that's something that might light a fire under Josh, too. Like, look, here's this new shiny kid. The kid's going to be here. What you going to do? For him, Quinn, Dunbar, et cetera, like, how you going to act? Um, for the Ravens, I'm with you, wide receiver. Either for Lamar purposes, I'm kind of with Emery. Go get DK. Go get you some big, Man, strong man. I wish DK would fall. Like, just like, you remember, y'all remember that old Michael Vick commercial where it was like a video game, he was running around, he threw the yep. T.O.? Mm -hmm. Like, go give Lamar something like that. Just go give him some big, dumb, crazy, that's unfair, however it works. Just let them go break stuff. Um, Cardell, for your, your team personally, what would you like your team to do? I mean, since we lost Marshall, um, Probably got to get a linebacker. We can't just leave on naked out there. Um, we got a bunch of improving guys there, but we definitely, I would definitely want to see a quarterback. Um, if Hackins, if Hackins there, you can't pass up on him. I think he's more talented than any linebacker um, at that at that point. Um, you know, maybe Devin White if he's still there, but I know he might go early. Um, the guy who I'm, I'm really starting to find out about, Devin Bush, I yeah. thought he was kind of on the smaller side, so I wasn't sure, but he's so fast, I think yeah. that makes up for it. Um, I think that's where he might go. I think he kind of, I think Elway might just get a quarterback later on since they got Flacco, but I'm just mm -hmm. not sure on Flacco where his mind would be, man. You know, it's just, I don't know, Who's your backup? Exactly. No, I'm be honest, I don't know. I know, exactly. <laughs> uh, Similar situation. But maybe, maybe, uh, um, I remember, uh, uh, what's an Emory? I was yeah. reading some of his stuff, and he was talking about Drew Locke a little bit. Yep. Maybe him later on, because I think we got two first round picks. But I think you got to shore up that defense. So Vaughn is not out there just trying to be everything. Yeah, yeah, you know, you putting too much on them. They've been doing that enough lately. So get get that, and then because Flacco is an insurance, it is better than what we had. But then try to get a um, somebody like a Drew Locke, somebody that can grow under there, and you don't need time. And then you should be good. I like that. Who do you right. want? Uh, I want anybody but Bosa. <laughs> you um, getting Bosa? <laughs> now nah, I want anybody but Bosa. Like if Bosa is the only option, trade back. Um, <laughs> honestly, I want Quentin Williams though. How's your quarterback recovering? Is he back? Uh, yeah, he's back. He's he cool. got the brace on there, out there doing. So will he be ready conducting. for? I think he, I think he will be. Him and Jarek. Him and our star running back that. Had uh, Jarek McKinnon. Yeah, because Jack got hurt two weeks before okay. Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, cause he got hurt before the season started. Yeah, like the week before. Um, I want Quentin Williams, man. Like my biggest thing is Quentin put on some extra weight to go play inside at Bama. I just want f the four most disruptive human beings you can find <laughs> to play up there, and you can figure out the placement later. I just want it so all five offensive linemen are like, oh my god, like I can't help you, 
because I got my hands full. You know what I'm saying? I just want that. I don't, I don't, and, and like Bosa, I know some people like it for me. I feel like he's good. I don't want good. I want something disruptive. I want something that, that high, like, yeah. I, like if freakish, you're going that like high, freakishly amazing, no, like I want, athletic, I want, everything. I want something that break the, like break things, game breakers. Like I want something where even by accident, they ruin something. Right. Like the pocket died. Like even if he didn't get the play, you gotta find him. You want like, somebody like Aaron Donald or something? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I want Quinn. I mean, you gotta yeah. deal with that one. <laughs> That's exactly why I want Quinn. But get over to finestmag.com. Get over to mymonosports.com. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, man, we got some new stuff coming up for you. We told y'all. Yes, indeed. Uh, with the pro, uh, we got this thing called the roundtable coming shortly. Um, shout out to the WNBA to deal with CBS Sports. Yeah. Um, definitely looking forward to that. Hopefully that. You know, with the CBA coming up, this turns into some added revenue to keep these women here in the States instead of that 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 long grind they deal with, the year-long grind, which isn't kind to any athlete's body at all. But uh, thanks for watching The Focus TV. We'll get it to you guys next week, same time, same place.